Welcome to IHS Energy Sierra Week 2015. My name is Judd Jacobs, and I'm a research director with IHS Energy. I'm joined today by David Eiten, who is the head of technology with BP. Welcome, David, and welcome back to Sierra Week. It's a pleasure to be here, Judd. So maybe we could start off just a bit about telling us your role and responsibilities as head of technology at BP. I have responsibility ultimately for all the technology we do, mm -hmm. upstream technology, downstream technology, our low carbon businesses. As head of technology, how, how is your job and responsibility, and how, how are things changing over the last six months for you? I think this is probably the fifth oil price crash in my career. Mm -hmm. And what I would say from a technology perspective is actually most things have not changed. Mm -hmm. A lot of things carry on pretty much as they were. But there have been some changes, definitely. Yeah. And I think the biggest change has probably been the consequence of strategic choices the company's made. So where capital programs have been impacted by the low oil price environment, that changes the, the case for mm -hmm. investing in technology. And some choices have been to cease investing, for example, in the cellulosic biofuels. Yeah. So that clearly has consequences for the technologies and the teams that we've been investing in. Um, the other you know, uh, big area of difference yeah. is that I would say there's a big pull on those technologies that can help in the current environment. Things that can make you safer, make things lower cost, make things more efficient. There's a big pull on those. If anything, expenditure might be increasing slightly in those areas. Interesting. Can you give us a few examples? So what's actually going to allow you to drive greater efficiency and improve safety? Um, I think probably uh, a, a great one is the application of a whole suite of digital technologies from sensing okay. through data analytics to automation that mean you're better aware of the state of integrity, for example, mm -hmm. of your facilities earlier. You can intervene earlier if there's any signs of concern, that kind of thing. So, and these, these are not particularly expensive technologies yeah, to install yeah. and use. And they have a, as a wide range of, uh, you know, paces. I, I, the one I, I would I would pull out probably is, um, you know, it used to be the case that you had people dangling off platforms on ropes yeah. to go and inspect pipes and risers and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's actually quite an expensive thing as well. They're quite specialist contractors and they're at risk doing it. Now all that can be done with remotely automated mm -hmm. crawler mm -hmm. devices and they're cheaper oh, and it's more auditable, it's more reliable. So I mean, that's a great example of something where a lot of pull in the current environment to make things better and safer. It's really interesting. I guess you're beginning to see technologies then that are developed possibly in other industries, whether robotics, whether in the military. And are you looking at those within BP's portfolio and considering them? Are those, are those gaining, gaining greater entree? Absolutely, yes. I, I, don't, I wouldn't claim that this industry is in the vanguard of the application mm -hmm. of some of these technologies. Fly-by-wire has been around for quite a while yeah, yeah, in aircraft, yeah. for example. And there are reasons why it has been more difficult. I mean, it's, it's a high hazard environment. A lot of the equipment has to be rated to, a, to, you know, to zone one before you can use it. And it's you know, a less in a controllable environment in some yep. respects to talk about drilling you know you don't really know what you're drilling into it's not quite the same thing on the other hand i think all these technologies have been ruggedized marinized proved up um, for operation and environment and so now there there's a whole suite of them that are being deployed and of course the technologies themselves are just screaming ahead yeah, in terms yeah. of developments every 18 months, you know, doubles in power. And so that also mm. means that they're increasingly attractive to pull into our industry. That's fa it's, it's fascinating to hear that the, the, the digital revolution seems to be making its way into the oil and gas sector now. Yeah, if anything, I'd say that we're probably spending more on that this year than we did last year, despite the drop in oil price. That's interesting. You know, I mean, of course, changes, you know, the, with your focus areas, those are some of the things that are changing. Are, are you thinking differently as well about how to source these technologies and how to develop them. Is that, is that impacting you at all? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, I mean, I think that there's a, there's a premium always placed on owning something, controlling it, mm -hmm. doing it all by yourself, but that comes at a price. And I, I absolutely think it's the case that the current environment is causing us to think hard about, well, can we justify doing things all by ourselves? Or might there be benefit in collaborating with others? So you spend less, you have slightly less control. Mm -hmm. Often, though, it can be scaled more quickly in the industry if there's a, a group of people. And I mean, a good example of that would be Project 20K, the, the equipment uh, yeah. for the higher pressure, high temperature trends like the Paleogene in the Gulf of Mexico, where I think when we kicked that off, back in, I think it's 2012, you know, at that point in time, you felt quite lonely. Mm -hmm. um, increasingly, we've begun to work with major suppliers, 
and now more recently again working very closely with some big operators and the whole deal in the Gulf yeah, of Mexico yeah, with yeah. Chevron as operator and, and ConocoPhillips is an example of beginning to pool your resources and all I can say is I think that that's you know particularly um, driven in, in the current environment that kind of yeah. collaborative approach to technology development and more generally to, to field development. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting to see a couple of these themes that seem to be, if anything, the current environment is accelerating them, what's already been going, is that you're, you're really beginning to see these kick in, which could be a benefit to the industry. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think it forces you to make choices, and choices are never, you know, a bad thing, actually. I mean, yeah. being real clear about what's really important and putting your whole weight behind the things that you really care about and you really want to make work uh, is always, I think, pretty healthy for any yeah. company. I mean, it's a fascinating conversation. I know that technology is going to be such a major theme of uh, Zero Week 2015 that uh, many of these, many of these uh, items are going to come up again and again. So we look forward to discussing them with you and with, uh, with the rest of the guests as well. Yeah, I'm interested to find out how the people yeah. are talking about it. I know how it feels inside yeah. BP, um, but one of the great things about Zero Week is it gives me a chance to find out how other companies are responding to it, what they're pushing mm. on, what they're pulling back from. And of course, you know, there are partners met for, of many of ours in, in different situations, so that gives us a better sense of how we work with them. Yeah, I mean, it's a great opportunity to have a meeting of many, many of the minds in the industry, so we're, we're really looking forward to the week coming forward. Mm. And uh, thank you. Thank you again for participating, and thank you for joining us at Zero Week 2015. Yeah, thank you very much.